and there are all the devotees. But you can see Prabhupada after arriving 10 hours on the plane, 12 hours, sometimes 15 hour flight, he's always fresh and spry. Navayovana, Krishna's Navayovana. So Prabhupada was the servant of the ever fresh Krishna, so he was always spry himself too. The Prabhupada's weighted down with the flowers. <laughs> There's never too many flowers. Prabhupada would distribute the flowers. And there he is, a, from material calculation, an old man walking with the young, spry, enthusiastic devotees. This was a great scene. Prabhupada felt comfortable in the the presence of all the young, enthusiastic devotees. He didn't feel out of place. Srila Prabhupada would only come to Australia once a year, which was quite uh, good, considering the remoteness of the country. But Prabhupada came to Australia six different times. This is a good picture. On the right is the temple, and on the left is the Prabhupada house beautiful yellow and white. We painted the whole house. Up on the top it said Prabhupada House. There's a widow's walk on the top where they could look out into the ocean. There's Prabhupada walking in. This old house uh, was about 100 years old, a Victorian house, a historical house. It was the first house in the whole neighborhood that was built by this rich man. All the details about it you can get from Korma's book. The Great Transcendental Adventure by Cormor Das, the cook. The whole house was redone and uh, we made it very elaborate, ebony wood and the drapes and the walls and the floors were all done over and the chandelier and and uh, Prabhupada walked in and he looked around and he says, oh, all this is for me? <laughs> and we said, yes Prabhupada, this is Prabhupada's house, your house. So we were, we were very happy. But before this time, we had always been operating out of small houses and storefronts and the devotees collecting in the streets and uh, enduring a lot of different hardships, distributing Srila Prabhupada's books. So moving into this new temple and inviting people was the crowning glory of all their efforts. And it, it was a time of great pride uh, for the devotees to showcase their spiritual master in such a, a beautiful setting and such a relaxed atmosphere. And, this marked a, a great historic time in Australia, Yatra. When Prabhupada came back and they took him up to his room, and uh, so I went up there and brought this beautiful silver bowl with these peanuts and spiced rice bubbles in it. And I came in and put it down before Prabhupada and paid my obeisances. And then Prabhupada took out his Gayatri thread and started chanting his Gayatri. So all the other big Brahmins in the room put out that Gayatri thread and sat there like this. And then after a very short time, Prabhupada finished chanting his Gayatri. <laughs> Everyone else still had their, you know, sacred thread hooked around their thumbs. So <laughs> Prabhupada reached into this bowl of these spiced rice bubbles picked up a little bit and handed it to the nearest Brahman who <laughs> still had his thumb hooked around his kaitri thread. <laughs> and what a dilemma. So all the devotees immediately stopped handing their kaitri, put their hands out and accepted what Prabhupada was offering them. <laughs> uh, I've later found out from Shruta Kirti's book uh, this was a fairly common occurrence that uh, Prabhupada chanted his Gayatri very quickly. So um, one by one the devotees got up and left the room and I was still sitting there alone with Prabhupada. And um, he asked me what my service is. I said, Prabhupada, I, I do cooking and uh, deity worship. He said, oh, that is very nice. <laughs> This is one of the things I think the devotees really appreciate, and I talk about it a lot, is, you know, it's seeing how, or hearing how Prabhupada lived, that, you know, we all need to see and know how Prabhupada practiced Krishna consciousness. And taking prasadam was, to me, was just such a, 
a wonderful activity the way he did it. You can see he always took prasadam alone 99% of the time. And if there was someone who was in the room and I would bring him prasadam, you know, he would just very graciously, he would take off a piece of fruit or two or three for whoever was there, or a little sweet, and just give them a little something and say, okay, Hare Krishna, and, and send them on their way. And then he would sit there and he would just honor prasadam. You know, he did it very calmly and peacefully and never in a rushed way, never talking about different things. But he, he relished prasadam. It was such a nice thing to see. There's another thing we do, especially as, as Westerners. You know, we can turn taking prasadam into meeting times and just socializing times with other devotees. Just carelessly, you know, talking about whatever and uh, really not get into the significance of honoring prasadam, mercy from Krishna. You could see with Prabhupada, he took it in that way. You could just feel, you know, he was honoring Krishna in the form of his prasadam. So wherever he was, prasadam he was ready to have right around noontime. And as he traveled and the time changes, he would just immediately adapt. There was no adjustment periods for Prabhupada. Never talked about jet lag, having to recover, you know, take a day off. Just went right in and immediately accepted his responsibilities that he had, you know, given himself, giving class, greeting the deities, morning walk, meeting with the devotees, the management, giving advice. Those were such endearing clips. After being on the plane for over 10 hours, Srila Prabhupada still looks so radiant. The pure servant of ever-fresh Sri Krishna would naturally be ever-fresh too. It was interesting to note that Srila Prabhupada would prefer to honour Prashad alone. He ate calmly and peacefully, really relishing Sri Krishna's mercy, truly respectfully honouring Krishna in his Prashad form. So next time you take Prashadam, Think about what you're doing and take Srila Prabhupada's example.